So people can, uh, for everybody that's joined early, uh, I had to start the broadcast early so we could set up Dennis's deal. I didn't have him set up correctly. Can you believe that? But we'll be rolling here in about a few minutes. Dennis, you're looking good. I thank you. I'm feeling good. I'm glad to be here. The wines smell incredible. Thank you. It, sm it smells like victory. <laughs> Hi, Shelly. Hi. <laughs> I love your backdrop. Are you at the at the restaurant? All right. Alan, restaurant. Alan nice. Thomas is here. Brad Gray, Brent, Chuck Bloom, Cliff. Alan Danny Thomas. And Debbie. Yeah. I've known Ava Alan Kane. since I was eight. The Dicklers are here. Right on. Eric Hoganboom. All right. Chukowski is in the house, Jamie Castro, Jason Guerrero. All right. Oh, it's nice. Watson. You, can, you can see everyone now. This is great. Mark White, Michael Massey, Michael Karen Bover, Neil Stacy. Hey, Neil. Oh, man. I hope you and Nancy are doing great. Robert Ludwig, Steve McCullough, Tom Knizek. Oh, man. This is awesome. What do we have? 252? Okay, everybody, just relax and, and have too much Chardonnay right now. Dennis, we have to get down to Palo Alto. I haven't seen you in six years. Oh, my gosh. Well, we're not exactly right around the corner, but uh, I, I would love to, to have you here at the restaurant. Yes, yeah. yes. Been Nothing I would uh, enjoy more than that, sharing the restaurant with you guys. So what's it like being in the restaurant with nobody there? I, I went to the office today, and it was just depressing, you know? It, it's depressing, but at the same time, it's exciting because it's like a fresh start, you know? It's, it's allowed me to have a fresh perspective on the restaurant, you know? And uh, I'm sure be very grateful that it's there. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, the last time we were in this position of waiting, we were under construction, and that was so much more stressful for me personally. No kidding. Man. Yeah. That was a stressful process, you know, you want everything to be just right. And, you know, we, we had a very specific vision and, you know, as things are completed, they're wrapped in paper. And so at some point everything's just wrapped in paper and you're like, what's it going to look like when it all comes together? You know, is it going to be harmonious? And uh, it was just a stressful pro process, you know, timing, getting a staff hired and trained, but not having them wait. Mm -hmm. and, and take a position elsewhere and delays and oh, it's just a nightmare. That's why it's taken us so long to do anything else. We're, we're just trying to psych ourselves up for this process again. You know, it's easy to create and have visions and get them on paper. And at this point, I think we would have the support in terms of funding, but, you know, just trying to muster up the energy, the mental energy to, to actually take on an endeavor like this. I don't know how people like Thomas Keller do it, you know. We're all ready to get back out there and get into restaurants. <laughs> so, yeah. you know. Yeah, oh my gosh, Dennis, when we, when we get ready to go for this. All right, hello, Kansas City people. Uh, Basham's all right. Chuck Bloom, Cliff Schroeder, Courtney Kane. Hey, Daniel Goldman is here. The McQuarries are here. Oh man, this is so great. David, David Rashke. Uh, hey, Donna Gamboni. All right. God, so many cool people are here. Dwight Jepson, Eric Hoganboom. Jamie. J. Andrew Chikowski, Jamie Castro, Jason, Jason Guerrero, Jason Price. All right. Hey, Jeff and Brooke Vale. I love it. Well, you guys, I think That's we're just nice. about, we're just about there. Uh, hello, Vales. This is so great. Uh, Jim Hendrickson. Jo Joseph Kramer. You should definitely go by Jimmy, Jim. Um, Mac Merritt. Man, a lot of a lot of great people. The Bovers, Neil Stacy, Paul Pettit. Petra, was that? Petra? Hey, Philip Ku. Yeah. Oh, nice. Uh, Petra's in the house. Oh my goodness. Well, let's get started. Uh, I wanted to start by, uh, let me introduce the other folks on screen. Here up on top, sharing the screen uh, with me is our very own Christian Mullen from Robert Craig uh, Winery. 
And down below, in no particular order, of course, is my guest panelist today, uh, Dennis Kelly, who is the owner of Protege Palo Alto and a really longtime friend, uh, one of my favorite people in the business. And, uh, you know, formerly I met Dennis when he was uh, the wine director for the French Laundry back before he had his MS and was all famous and everything. Um, and, oh, I see Rod, Rod Fleming's here too. And then, of course, my lovely wife has to be on screen with me for an introduction. <laughs> so uh, with so much trouble in the world to all of our wine clubbers and customers and all of our friends and people that have, have logged on and, and come in to taste with us today, it should be a great experience. And I just wanted to introduce you to Shelly, uh, Christian, and then of course, Dennis, and then uh, Shelly's going to let me have my whole seat here in a minute, but I wanted to say <laughs> hi to everybody. We've, we've shared so much wine with all the people on screen. So darling, you're a star. You look better than I do, but I, I, don't, I can't have you upstaging me. Okay. Well, is everyone on? Should I yeah. just take an exit? I didn't see some of my friends pop on yet, but that's okay. Hey, we got to get this thing okay. started. We have, right. we have 45 minute hour of power. All right. Well, Shelly is going to be back behind the scenes. My kitty cat's definitely going to be slurping up some milk back there in, the, in terms of Robert Craig wine. Uh, but welcome, everybody. And Dennis, gosh, I think we met, you know, way back in like 2012 or 2013 when you took over the, the French Laundry. And I was uh, eight. Oh, I took over God. the program in 2008. Oh, my yeah. God, Dennis. So I can't believe we're that old. When you yeah, said you have a 24 year old daughter, I just about freaked out. <laughs> well, Time's I think about the last time that we had uh, dinner at the re at the restaurant when you were there was we had this um, we had this amazing meal. Uh, I put a shot of you pouring us that Jean Marc Boyot, mm -hmm. uh, Cleany Mont Rocher, the Combet that I or Combot that I love so much, uh, the Premier Cru, and uh, that is actually one of the wines that we fashioned this Durrell, this uh, Gaps Crown Chardonnay after, but. We started at 4.30 out on the patio and ended up with Madeira from the, from the 50s and 60s. Got back to our hotel at the North Block at 1 o'clock a.m. And then, boom, you know, it was the earthquake. And uh, so I know at the, at the restaurant at that time, where was it? You call it Siberia was your... Siberia was our off-site storage facility because the program at that time was about 15,000 bottles. And, you know... It was prior to building the new wine cellar at the restaurant. So um, most of our wine was actually off site. And so after I made sure my family was safe, I uh, said to my wife, Jessica, you know, I, I got to go check on Siberia. And I literally opened that door, took the light from my iPhone and flashed it in there. And it was a wine lake. And I just, I said, I can't deal with this right now. I literally just locked the door and walked away. And then we went back on Monday and just started sifting through the rubble, you know? Oh, it's, man. It's incredible. Yeah. Oh, as I was saying yesterday, uh, I think, you know, you had so many bottles in there. I'm sure you had uh, everything from Petrus to Domaine de Romana Conti to, you know, uh, all those yeah, collector right. bottles. Mm -hmm. at, at Craig, we would get that mop out and just squeeze all that into a mop <laughs> bucket and uh, use, it at, use, it, it out. use it around <laughs> the office for a cocktail. Uh, I know that Jamie Castro and Christian would at any rate. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. New wine by the uh, glass program. Yeah, the Harry Buffalo, <laughs> the Harry Craig. Well, uh, for everybody out there, you know, it's so great to have you on board. This has just been a, a rough time. We sell about 60% of all of our wine at Robert Craig to restaurants, which is how we came into contact with Dennis. And obviously with restaurants being out of business around the country, uh, it's really made us think deeply about, you know, our relationship with retail, which Dennis, don't worry, we're not going to be going out to the big <laughs> box stores, but God knows what our distributors are, are thinking about doing. But uh, it, it, our connection with our customers has just been the thing that's been getting us through this. And thank you all so much. We have two sold out webinars. I'd love to have everybody on the screen, but we can't do it in this format because we're going to have over 250 viewers uh, along with us today and it's just so many so many people but I want to bring uh, not only some Robert Craig to you today but a little outside perspective 
uh, with Dennis's expertise in wine and uh, his expertise and his long time in the restaurant business is fascinating. We ended up doing a practice session yesterday that went over about an hour because of the fact, I think, number one, Dennis isn't speaking to enough people these days. He had a lot to say about Chardonnay production, which may change the course of our Chardonnay production. But it's really going to be interesting, Dennis, to speak to you. So for everybody out there, the theme of the tasting is small lots, big flavors. The first tasting we did was uh, all about our Howe Mountain Estate because at Robert Craig, when I arrived in 2004 and I bought into the company in 2005, we were about 20% estate grown. And anymore, uh, this fruit that we're buying, I mean, the prices have gone up and up and up. And I, I think the only good news about COVID is that uh, I don't think that our, grow our growers, Peter Thompson or uh, Joan or Bill Price are going to raise prices on us this year because uh, obviously everybody's hurting for money. But we did keep these relationships with these very small growers that we still make small lots. Now we're 90% estate grown, but these are some wines that I just absolutely would hate to have to give up. Uh, and that is the theme of the tasting. So the Gaps Crown Chardonnay, we make about 300 cases of uh, Joan Crowley's wine. Every year we make about five to 600 cases uh, of the Spring Mountain. And then the Diamond Mountain, we make around 300 cases as well. So if you think about like an Opus One being 35,000 cases to 45,000 cases, these are really small lot wines, but they have a lot to offer. So our estate, our affinity, Howe Mountain, all the Howe Mountain wines and Mount Veter, we all own those. But these are three that we've had long time relationships on. So with that, uh, Dennis, why don't, you, uh, why don't you tell me, you know, uh, to sort of introduce yourself. We were talking yesterday, I found it fascinating. You know, when did you come to French Laundry and, and what do you think it was that you learned there that made uh, your transition to your own restaurant and probably like me, millions of dollars of debt uh, possible there in, in Palo Alto at Protégé? Well, I started back in 2005. I was managing at Martini House in St. Helena in 2004, and I really moved to the Napa Valley in hopes of eventually uh, working with Thomas Keller at the French Laundry. Um, after a year at Martini House, I was fortunate enough to get a uh, position as captain at the French Laundry. So I actually, my first three years from 2005 through 2008 worked as a captain uh, at the restaurant. and. That gave me sort of a unique perspective on what I thought the wine program needed. I was just really beginning my, my, uh, my process of learning wine in 2005. So I took the introductory examination with the quartermaster sommeliers in 2005, the certified in 06, the advanced in 07, and I was fortunate to pass those three examinations. I was planning on taking two years to, uh, to prepare for the master exam, and in that time I was promoted to head sommelier. I had never been a sommelier at all at any level, so it was quite a learning curve. Um, so I really just focused on learning the positions of my team. I had a five-person team at that point, and they were very generous about more or less training me on their positions so that I could determine what I needed to facilitate through each team member and what I wanted to take on myself. And um, that process and, and my journey along wine, which really uh, resumed back in 2011 uh, when I took the Master Sommelier examination in, in uh, Las Vegas and got theory so, service. Hang on one second. So 2005 through 2011. Yeah, so um, I, took, I took about from as soon as I got that head sommelier position in 2008, I was just focused on keeping my head above water and really learning my role. And so I was not going to tasting groups. I wasn't studying. I wasn't preparing for the examination at all. I didn't start to do that again until uh, January of 2011, when I learned that they were going to offer uh, an examination in September. And so I studied every single day for nine months. I went to tasting group every week, and I was fortunate to get theory and service. Uh, I had to retake tasting which I, I did in May of 2012, and that's when I passed my examination. Um, right but, on. Yeah, and, and as I was saying to you yesterday, I, I think the most valuable aspect of pursuing that goal was really just the relationships, you know, meeting 
are there sommeliers, winemakers, um, you know, the masters that kind of took me under their wing during the process. And, and those relationships have really helped me further my career. I think today a lot of people are so focused on accreditation and titles that they neglect the process of, of working, getting out there, getting on the floor, learning how to sell wine, learning how to find the right wine for the guest, learning how to build a program that's balanced and profitable. And I think all of those things I learned uh, at the French Laundry um, with the incredible support of, of Chef Keller and his team. That's, I mean, Dennis, you've always been one of those people that was super approachable when we discussed, you know, having the wines for our dinners. You know, I've got to get with Eric and, and get the wines back in there. It's, it's terrible that we don't have any wine at the laundry right now. God knows when everybody's going to reopen for that kind of stuff. But, uh, you know, it's always been amazing to me. I, I, like I said, since owning my own business, I've become a much better toilet scrubber. Uh, you know, I'm, that's why it's on my, that's why it's on my title because I'm always like, oh, for God's sake, we have people coming up here. So you have to do everything yourself. But uh, let me show, you know what, I'm going to share screen for a second, Dennis. I'm going to show people the photograph of your restaurant. Okay. We'll start with a beautiful day on Howl Mountain. So hang on, gang. Uh, I'm going to try this out here. So here's a little Howl Mountain for you. Uh, and look at that, huh? This is what kind of day it is. There's the, for those who haven't been up to the winery, here's what it looks like uh, on a day like today. We're on the summit of Howl Mountain at 2,400 feet. So if you haven't made it up to see Robert Craig, uh, I can tell you, I know uh, Peter and Igda uh, Warner are here and uh, they have been all over this place. But here's, here's the lounge. Uh, so Dennis has two dining options at, at Protégé. You can either do the lounge experience and order a la carte uh, or go to the dining room. It's kind of like, uh, you know, I think it's the, the West Coast version of, of Gramercy Tavern, Danny Meyer's great place. Yeah, but, that was really an inspiration for our concept. You know, seriously. The tavern and in our lounge, lounge is very much modeled after that. And then they do uh, tasting menus. They offer tasting menus in their dining room, and that's exactly what we do. We have a five-course tasting menu. And then, then oh, here's the only thing I'm really concerned about is this major, <laughs> this major wine room there. Check that out. Room in the house. Beautiful. If you have a ladder in your wine cellar, that's a different deal. So did that look good? Hopefully that came off okay. It did. That was great. Thanks for showing that. Yeah, come on, Dennis. I got. I, I'm. I'm. I'm working on my uh, IT skills here, as well as my, as well as growing my. What's my way, my friend. <laughs> so let's dive into some Chardonnay, and we'll keep talking about you and me. And uh, Christian, do we have any questions rolling up here? Um, the only question really that popped up was the order in which we're drinking the reds. We are going to. We're going to go Chardonnay, and then we're going to do 2014 Spring Mountain and then 2016 Diamond. So I know, Dennis, you like to drink them, you like to drink them, uh, you know, young to old, but... No, I, th I think I agree with your selection here, uh, just because of the power of uh, that, uh, that Diamond Mountain wine. The diamond is a beast. Yeah. So, you know, Chardonnay is one thing, this, this Gaps Crown Vineyard, and I'm going to share screen briefly so I can show you all a shot of the vineyard. So this is, this is the Gaps Crown Vineyard. It sits at 900 feet of elevation, uh, right on the summit of the Petaluma Gap, where it's foggy, freezing cold. These vines are about uh, 35 years old. Uh, they get about two and a half tons an acre, so very low yield. And it's just a, even in, even when you go over there and it's a gorgeous day in Napa in July or August, you go over to Gaps Crown and it's freezing cold. You have to wear a down coat because it's a fog pocket. It's windy, it's miserable. And that's why grapes love it. I mean, you know, we were speaking about the wines yesterday and the fact that I like our Chardonnay a little reductive, a little Burgundy, a little Burgundian. And for you folks out there, that means there's a very little oxygen exchange in the wine. So you get like a little bit of gunpowder, a little bit of flint, a little classic sort of uh, Burgundian feel to the wine. And it's made, our wine's made to live a long time in the cellar. I think this wine 20 years after vintage date is still going to be showing very well. So along with Maya Camus, uh, Hanzel, Chateau Manalena, 
those are the Chardonnays I think of as maybe Markinson, but Markinson, the style of Markinson is so wildly removed from this, you know. So Dennis, give me your thoughts on the Chardonnay. Yeah, I agree with you. It, it does have some reductive notes. I think the oak is beautifully integrated. Um, it's certainly supporting the richness of the wine, but um, very, very beautifully balanced. Um, I think that the fruit profile is very crisp, uh, still a little bit crunchy, which I really like. I think it makes the wine a little bit more food friendly, which is really one of the sort of hallmarks of Robert Craig for me over the years. And, uh, you know, I first visited the winery back in 2005, my first year at the French Laundry. And the thing that struck me most about uh, the winery overall was just the sense of balance in the wines. Uh, I've always preferred wines that had elegance and to me balance is key. Uh, and I really find that in this wine. It's uh, ripe and rich enough for those who are really looking for the concentration and intensity of uh, California wines, but at the same time, um, very deft oak usage. I like the fact that the wine is not buttery um, no malolactic um, for this particular wine, which I think, again, keeps the fruit a little bit more in that sort of green apple, white peach category, opposed to the really ripe yellow fruits. Um, so I, th I think it's just a, a beautiful expression of California Chardonnay, really Thank you. Just and, in line with my, my preference stylistically. Well, and Gap's Crown is one of those vineyards, you know, we used to make a Durrell Chardonnay, but, uh, and I love the wine, and it would do 10 years after vintage date. We were just drinking the 2010 in the office and it was so pretty, but it just did not, it just wants to be fatter, you know? And the, uh, the Jarrell would come in consistently at like 365 pH, which is very typical of California Chardonnay from a good vineyard site, a cool vineyard site. And, uh, you know, Domaine Raveneau, their, you know, Le Clos Chablis, that thing is like 3.3 three, and this is 3.2. I mean, this, these wines, this vineyard has very low pH, which for all of you out there that don't do wine every day, you know, for a living, uh, there's an inverse relationship between acidity and pH. So the lower the, the lower the pH, the higher the acid generally in the wine, the more nerve the wine has. And this wine just has a tremendous amount of nerve. And I think the 16 and the 17 are like this. Uh, these are just great years. The 18 is a little more uh, laser beam, a little more tight. And then for uh, 19, we're going for something that actually hurts your face to drink. So it's going to, it's going to regress a little bit to uh, the, you know, that ultra style. Mm -hmm. But everybody so, knows us so much for Cabernet Sauvignon, the fact that we make Chardonnay, I mean, uh, on the, on the back label, if you read it, I actually put a portion of your purchase will go to the Tamales Bay Oyster Overpopulation Concerned Citizens Alliance. And that's all that's going on the back label for next year's bottling. Because <laughs> it's a joke, but you know, it's on the back label. Reduction is one of those things that a lot of times people hear, people like you and me talk about, but they're not really sure how to perceive it. And it really is that sort of flinty character uh, in the wine. And, and that is achieved, I, I, you know, I know this wine um, was raised, 40% of it raised in stainless steel. So obviously little to no oxygen tra transfer. And, and when fermenting yeast are in a nitrogen deficient environment, 80% of the air we breathe is nitrogen, uh, they start to stress and they can clean other compounds. And the result is uh, essentially sulfur. Um, and that's what you're smelling when you get those sort of uh, flinty notes is sulfur compounds um, that are produced as a byproduct of yeast stressing in a nitrogen uh, deficient environment. And there are a number of ways of achieving that. You guys obviously achieved it through stainless steel um, and through minimizing oxygen. We talked yesterday about potentially creating warmer fermentations through larger vessels. Um, sometimes people will put barrels in warmer cellars to use more yeast assimilable nitrogen and get in a reduction state earlier. But um, ultimately what it does is it gives it that really beautiful flinty note that we're experiencing on this wine today. Yeah, obviously on Howl Mountain, we struggle with getting any warmth up there at all. I mean, it is freaking cold. So we, I think we have the longest 
fermentation times, you know, our, our, the reds go through malolactic very, very late because, but it's been a great preservative for the wines over the year as well, over the years as well. But with the Chardonnay, something we do, and we were talking about that with Costa Rica, is we mash that mofo so hard, we get the press pressure up and really, really mash it uh, in order to expose the wine to oxygen. There's more solids initially in the wine. And then we don't do any surly stirring because I don't like a tremendous amount of batonnage where it's just that super lazy flavor. And with reduction, with the reductive flavor, I think, you know, it's important to mention, we don't want eggy, you know, you don't want like eggy sulfur. You want that flint, a little bit of that gunpowder, and you want that staying ability, that cellar ability of the wine where the, few, the fruit over the years can gradually just really pop up and explode. And yeah. I think after five years, this 15 is finally just really showing beyond that harshness initially. So any comments, people? Christian? Yeah, so we have a uh, question from Deanna Basham, actually a comment and a question. The acidity is uh, so crisp and beautiful. Very nice Chardonnay. Uh, what is the clone? Well, that is an excellent question. So this is a little bit of Dijon clone and a little bit of some number that I've never heard of. So that, that vineyard has some Wente, it has some Dijon, and then it has clone number, 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 number. And uh, I should know what that is. Dennis probably knows this better than I do. Well, they, they planted a number of different Dijon clones. And, and the reason that they did that is because um, obviously Dijon being in Burgundy a lot cooler this vineyard being particularly cool, they needed grape varieties or, or clonal varieties that would mature in such a cool climate in time. Um, because a lot of the more heirloom clones can struggle to ripen early enough in, you know, the Petaluma Gap. So it is very common to see uh, a series of Dijon clones planted in that area. And that's exactly what they did. Gap's Crown in both uh, the Chardonnay and Pinot was a series of various uh, clones. So I'm not sure which ones go into this bottling. I suspect it's probably a number of various clones, but for the most part, Gap's Crown, as you said, is plan planted largely to Dijon. Yeah, I mean, we get the it. same section of the vineyard, you know, every year because we want to be able to express that. We, we get one right at the top of the, right at the top of the vineyard. And the soils you can see are very chalky, you know, very chalky there. Mm -hmm. um, it really has almost that essence of Burgundy. So this is one of those wines, you know, we're a freaking Cabernet house. But Dennis, the the I have so many sommeliers, and we, we used to never send it out anywhere in the country. But I would go to New York and we'd do a wine dinner somewhere. And you know, then they'd say, Hey, you know, I gotta I gotta have that I have to have some of that Chardonnay and go, oh, you know. We don't ship to New York and then they just say, well, okay, well, I'll just take all the Cabernets off the list then. So, <laughs> you know, we have to send Chardonnay to New York City. So we're, we only have this in about seven or eight markets in the country. But for those of you that are, that are uh, tasting our Chardonnay for the first time, I wanted to include this on a Friday afternoon because I think Shelly weighs 110 pounds, but she can drink about... Something wet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. She can drink about uh, two bottles of this in one sitting, no problem. I'll have a little more. <laughs> All right, kitty, kitty cat needs some milk. <laughs> yeah, like, like I said, the, I really like the way that you balanced the oak level. Um, there's a little bit of uh, a really beautiful sort of toasted hazelnut quality to it, but um, it's not super smoky. You don't get vanilla. It's, it's really beautifully integrated. Thank you. It, we use some barrels that are, uh, that are from, it's from the same group that has, uh, that has Darnajou and Troy. And this is a barrel maker that is, this has a super light touch. And like you said, the barrel, these, these are super thin stay barrels, uh, you know, 22 millimeter instead of 28 millimeter or 30 millimeter. So the oak leaches very slowly and gently into the wine. It provides just a little bit of oxygen, uh, but it, it really is a nice enhancement. The oak does not sit on top of the Chardonnay. So Dennis, uh, I think in, in, terms of your, in terms of getting your, your MS, what, mm -hmm. what would you say was the hardest part of doing that? Would it be the, what, do you think it was the theory or the tasting? 
Yeah, I think theory just really requires discipline. So as I told you, I just studied every single day um, and, and I just committed to 15 minutes a day, which doesn't sound like much, but you know, it, it was, it was a low enough number where I couldn't weasel my way out of it. I, I said, Hey, I waste 15 minutes on, you know, at that time it was Facebook. Now it's Instagram. So I said, you know, I've only committed to 15 minutes. I can't let myself off the hook, but the reality is it's such a short period of time that a lot of times it'd be 20, 30, maybe even 40 minutes, but it was that repetition of doing that every day. So I could take on new information and then review it again tomorrow and the next day and the next day until I had it well enough that I could maybe look at it once every week or one, you know, twice every week. And that's how you put yourself in a position to learn more material. <clears throat> For me, ultimately, the, the most challenging part was the tasting process. I've never found myself to be a super intuitive taster. So I had to learn a more methodical approach. So I learned to assess structure accurately, acid, tannin, and alcohol. I always felt, uh, in fact, Paul Roberts told me when I got to the French Laundry that the truth is in the structure. Um, and then uh, beyond that, I started learning about impact aromatics. So these could be pyrazines, monoterpenes, trimethyl dihydronephthalene, oak inclusion, malolactic fermentation, stem inclusion, all these things create aromatic profiles that uh, once you can perceive them, it creates a process of elimination. You know, um, you know Grunerveld Leaner has rotundone and lees. It's got moderate plus acid, moderate alcohol. Um, you know, phenolic bitterness. And, and so then it just became a matter of knowing the profile for every grape that I was looking for. Um, so that, that was my approach. And, and uh, I think it's an approach that anyone can learn. You don't have to be a rock star taster. You don't have to be born a super taster to learn this, uh, this approach. And uh, so I love to share it here at the restaurant. Hey, I, as far as I'm concerned, uh, you're rock star enough. I'm surprised that, that you could even learn about pyrazines in the Napa Valley today. Ain't, ain't, ain't nobody making any, any uh, well, I guess there's still some vineyards, some old school guys that, that don't get it all ripe all the way or whatever, or in a, in a cooler area have the wrong variety, but. Well, you know. I mean, there is some green character though that you find, it's, it's one of the sort of varietal fingerprints of, of, Cabernet of all the Bordeaux grape varieties, right? Sauvignon Blanc, Cabernet, Cap Franc, Merlot, Malbec, Petit Bordeaux, they all have uh, some level, especially Cap Franc, they all have some level of pyrazine. And, and to your point, yes, it's true. The riper you get it, the less pyrazine is left in the grape. So it doesn't smell like a green pepper anymore, but there are some green elements in the wine. You might call it bay leaf or, you know, green tobacco, whatever it is, there are green aromatic qualities left in most Napa Cabernets. And if there isn't, then they really are starting to lose their varietal character. And you might as well be drinking a grape, you know, wine from a grape that doesn't have pyrazine at that point, Zinfandel or something along that line. So I think it is important to retain some of that pyrazine character. Again, we don't necessarily want it to smell like a green pepper in the Napa Valley, but um, there are some green elements that you still find even in these well-balanced wines in front of me. Well, Christian? We have another question. Uh, so regarding the Chardonnay, uh, barrel age on the Chard, completely neutral? No, it is. So the Chardonnay sees, uh, every year it sees about uh, 20 to 25% of it sees brand new French oak for about four months. Uh, we neutral barrel ferment a lot more. We're doing less and less stainless and uh, and after speaking to Dennis yesterday, we had a fascinating conversation that even one, two, three-year-old barrels are still imparting some oak character. So with the Chardonnay in the future, we're probably going to start using, we're going to save some barrels and use four-year-old barrels that have crystallized on the inside. So really prevent the oxidative quality that we don't want in the, uh, in the wine and any sort of further barrel uh, uh, impart transfer. Because, you know, I, I did make a lot at first with, with way back in the day with Stephen and Keith Emerson. Uh, Keith's still with us and in, in, uh, as consulting winemaker and over at Vineyard 29. But I made a lot, I said, I just wanna do a no oak, totally no neutral Chardonnay. 
and focus on this fruit. And then we're all doing the brown bag tasting. And I said, what lot is this? This tastes like shit. You know, we got to get, we got to get rid of this, man. Like who, what, what have you done to this? And I got all, you know, and they're like, eh, hey, cheers, Elton, man, that's the one you wanted. So, um, in any event, that was a mistake. But, but after, you know, Dennis, uh, so, the, so the barrel program is, that's pretty much it. And then it's, you know, some stainless, but if you, if you use too much stainless, the wine can taste a little tanky. You know, it gets like a, it gets, it gets like a flavor from the tank. So we've gone away from, even our tasting notes are probably a little bit wrong in, in that we're using about, I think, predominantly two and three year old barrels uh, for a lot of that fermentation, a lot of neutral aging, because sometimes you would get like a, you know, even that stirring the lees, I want the, I want the brightness to continually exist in the wine for years and years and co to come. So brightness, flinty, a display of that chalky soil, and, and we're in. But uh, in speaking with Dennis yesterday, we were speaking about the benefit, Dennis, of having those larger fermentation vessels and creating more, you know, more heat and, uh, you know, kicking that nitrogen up. Um, and I, I think that that may be a way, I think it's so interesting that conversation is going to change how we make Chardonnay at Robert Craig. I know Jason Price, our winemaker, is watching this going, oh, for God's sake, Elton. you know, what, what is it now? Well, let's get, let's roll on to let's roll on to Cabernet uh, Sauvignon here because we're talking about pyrazines and and I think I, I chose a 14 mm. Spring Mountain because of the fact that Spring always gets the short end of the stick and the in the 14s you know um, Parker and Galoni gave the the Howland Veter and and Diamond all like 95 and the Spring always gets one point less than those wines because it's more supple. But this is old school spring, kind of like Philip Togni from Joan Crowley's Vineyard. So let me go to share screen and see if I make it back to us here. Um, okay, so now this is the Spring Mountain Vineyard, all organic, biodynamic, dry farm. You can see it looking. So this is looking straight across the valley at our place on Howl Mountain in St. Helena. This is about 2,000 feet. And here is the soil for Spring Mountain. You can see it's, it's more of a red soil. It's, it's uh, crumbly. It holds a little more water than the Howl Mountain soils. All right, so uh, could you guys see that okay? Oh yeah. Great. I tell you, I'm becoming a Jedi master of this stuff. <laughs> so I again am back to using my, uh, the Riedel Tyrol glass for because I cannot stand buffing glasses anymore. So these just fit right in the dishwasher short stem. I've had it with buffing glasses. So this is the Spring Mountain 2014. Is that glass actually for wine, Elton, or is it for something else? Oh, well, you know, since COVID hit, uh, I use it to collect tips while I'm playing guitar down at the Sausalito <laughs> Fountain. Wash your coins, please, I always say. Wash your coins before throwing those in. Oh, that's dynamite. So the Spring Mountain always has this super exotic perfume, Dennis. And, and uh, the one thing, when you say pyrazine, it definitely has that. We get, we get this is the one vineyard uh, that I really accept Cabernet Franc from, except for our affinity program uses a little bit, because in the mountains, we're, we're always fighting these, we have these huge wines, massive tannin, and by the time you get, by the time you get the extraction and the phenolic ripeness you want, uh, tannin comes with the wine. It's like Randy Dunn said, you know, hey, here's the Napa Valley, but the mountain wine's more tannic, there's nothing we can do about it. And if you use Cabernet Franc, it tends to be lower color, very high tannin variety. So we don't use a lot of Cabernet Franc. This is the one exception where the Cabernet Franc from that property is super lush and super aromatic. And then we usually blend it with a little bit of Petit Bordeaux uh, and a little bit of Malbec if uh, we get the chance. But this wine, starting in 14, we started to get the very best block of the vineyard. And so uh, the vineyard, even though it's only 13 acres, some parts are great and some parts are uh, really great. And this is from the really great part. It's on a pure volcanic shelf and it's south facing. 
And uh, this, this particular portion of the vineyard ripens very easily, whereas some of the other portions used to struggle. So I'd be interested to hear what you think of the wine. Well, one of the things that I love about it is that it's got a, a really nice combination of both uh, red and black fruit. So I, I find a lot of Napa Cabernets can be very black fruit driven, and that's uh, not a negative thing necessarily, but I really do enjoy wines that have a little more high tone red fruit. Um, and and I, I'm getting that in this particular wine. So it's, it's a nice combination of both. Um, I'm getting sort of that uh, brambly berry quality in addition to that sort of cassis blackberry uh, character. Um, I do get green elements, but again, to me, it's, it's a lot like bay leaf or pipe tobacco, um, a little bit of cedar in here. You are getting yes. some very subtle baking spices from the oak. Um, again, you know, after now, what, six years, it's, it's very well integrated. Still fresh and vibrant though, but it, it does have a little more exotic quality to it than uh, the second Cabernet, which to me really is a wine that still to this day, you know, is, is going to have a long, long life ahead of it. I think that the 2014 um, Howe Mountain is just starting to really come into its own. It's really in a beautiful place right now. Um, but again, very, very well balanced. I'm not getting uh, overtly green character and I'm not getting, uh, you know, dried fruit character. It's, it's just the sweet spot in the vineyard. You guys were very careful about, um, you know, your harvesting. And, and again, it's just beautifully balanced. And I think that's the key. Thank you. Now, hopefully you are drinking the Spring Mountain, Dennis. You said Howe Mountain, but hopefully- Oh, I'm sorry, Spring Mountain. Pardon me. Okay, it good. is Spring Mountain, yeah. Because I don't know if I, I think I may have sent you a couple of, a uh, couple of tasty bottles along for your your personal you did, yeah. No, but you sent me two, two of the Spring and two of the Diamond uh, Mountain. And I've yeah, opened. well, the, the Spring has, like I said, we started getting fruit from this vineyard in 2005. And uh, that was when the guy named, uh, we used to call him Mark the Claw, which is terrible because he had one hand where, you know, the guy wasn't that bright and he had, he was missing some fingers from a farming accident. And, uh, you know, I go out there, <laughs> I go out there, I know it's terrible. I go out there with Steve and Tev and say, and say <laughs> Mark, you know, man, like you have got to drop some fruit here. You know, the, it'd be like crazy bushy, like, you know, and this place is dry farmed, right? And, and so I come back, he said, well, you know, he was, he was like a, a, an Aussie and he'd say, I, I, you know, I, I dropped some fruit. Uh, I think you should come have a look and you go out and he would drop all of the good fruit in the fruit zone and leave the stuff like <laughs> up here, down here, all the bunches that were overlapping. So, you know, the vineyard's so great that 2005, six, seven, eight, you know, we made, we made killer wine, but starting 14, we turned a corner and the, like the 15, 16, 17 from this vineyard are amazingly powerful wines. The 14 is the most mellow, you know, wine. So I say to all of you out there, uh, this wine with a couple hours of decant can be enjoyed now, but I think this one, you know, has easily another 20 years to go uh, to 25 years to go in the cellar, whereas the, the 16 is going to do 40 years standing on its head. But if, if you give these wines, you know, six years after vintage day, boy, is this, I mean, God, I haven't had 14, I haven't had the 14s or 15s because they're just on either side of our library releases and they're just showing amazingly well. So everybody, again, I just want to let you know, I disabled the chat for all of our viewers out there. And, but the Q&A is going. So if you have a question, uh, write it down and Christian will get with us and, and Dennis and I will answer it or I'll fake it and Dennis will, will answer it in a knowledgeable fashion. I do have one. Speaking of mountain fruit, uh, what's, and I know the answer because you beat it into my head, but what's the difference in tonnage from mountain to floor uh, harvesting? Yes, so average, you know, average tons on uh, valley floor now, it's more high density plantings. So it's gone to more 1,800 to 2,000 vines an acre versus, you know, what was traditional uh, 1,900, 1,100 vines an acre. And so valley floor has gone from an average of about four tons an acre to five and a half. 
tons an acre now and uh, still on Howell Mountain over the last 10 years between our two vineyards we've averaged just under two tons an acre so it's all about selection you know longer hang time the spring mountain property is about two and a half tons an acre uh, so these properties you're talking very very small berries and um, I don't know, I don't know if I, I, I had the shot of it up earlier, but you can see just how few bunches, when you go on the valley floor, people come up to the mountain sometimes and say, did you guys already pick? And I'm like, no, <laughs> you know, there's fruit here. That's not the second crop, that's the first crop. Right, awesome. So- Mine's got a beautiful uh, floral quality. You know, you get the, yes. the commune of Margot a lot, and I'm getting that here, just, Violets, it's just very perfumed, a little more feminine than the, the second Cabernet. Agreed. And to me, this wine always has sort of this conifer forest floor, this mountain violet quality, this sort of exotic uh, mountain flower quality. And that's why I think sometimes the press thinks of it as a pretty wine. But I'm telling you, if, you know, that 05 and that 06 right now are so spectacular, our first two vintages, that it really is one of those wines that needs time and it continues to evolve. So I completely agree that this would be the Margot of our Cabernets. And you know, the, the Diamond Mountain is, that might be Saint Julien because it has that fruit pop. You know, it reminds me of like a, a Becheville or a, a Leoville Las Casas or something where it has that powerful fruit and that huge structure, but also a little bit of finesse. Yes. So, I'm missing out. Oh, my my darling, I've been I've been abusing my wife, <laughs> Shelly. And hearing all this talk, I need to partake. Thank you. Like I said, she's been drinking right. her second <laughs> bottle of Chardonnay. Uh, so, Dennis, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about you know uh, protege? I mean, what's the, you know I know that I know that Anthony came over, and uh, for those of you that didn't know Anthony, uh, both uh, Anthony who was. Um, one of the awesome sous chefs at French Laundry during the time there. And then uh, Eddie, the, the uh, pastry chef that you guys have both came over. So why don't you, why don't you talk about what your vision was for uh, your restaurant? Well, most importantly, Anthony is my, my partner. He's my business partner. And uh, as you said, he was a sous chef at the French Laundry. He had come to us from El Bouilly in Rosa, Spain. Prior to that, he was at Acalare. So a lot of, uh, and those are both three-star Michelins in Spain. So a lot of Spanish uh, influence in his cuisine. Um, we always had a very similar uh, management style. You know, we're both Midwestern boys. I'm from Cleveland. He's from the Chicago area. And we always uh, just had a mutual respect and, and talked about potentially working together one day. Um, as you mentioned earlier, you know, the inspiration in terms of the concept was restaurants like Gramercy Tavern, where you have sort of a dual concept. Um, a restaurant is a community, and we feel like we can take care of the whole community here. You know, if people are picking the kids up from uh, soccer practice and they're on their way home and they want the brick chicken, we've got the lounge. You know, if they're celebrating grandma's uh, birthday or a big uh, anniversary, we've got the, the dining room where we, we do the five course tasting menus. Um, this area, Palo Alto, um, is a very casual, area and so we wanted to create a restaurant that was very comfortable so even though we're trying to uh, implement what we learned at restaurants like the french laundry i spent almost a year at manresa um, we're trying to impart those standards but apply them to a much more comfortable environment and that's really what the restaurant is about is uh, you know making our, our local community comfortable well there's this whole movement in paris now where you know a lot of the chefs they don't want anybody from Michelin in their place. And I realize you guys have a more casual concept than Menresa or French Laundry mm -hmm. or the restaurant at Meadowood. Absolutely. But, you know, I think it's so cool that you were still recognized by the Michelin Guide with a, with a star. And Michael Bauer is a, he's a, you know, before he left the Chronicle, he was the grumpiest human being on the planet Earth. <laughs> and he gave you guys his highest rating of three right, stars. Yeah for San Francisco Chronicle. And so I just have to say, well done. And you're, you're busy like crazy. And I, I just wanna tell everybody here uh, that when, when we get out of this, 
Um, you know, Dennis's investors have been great enough to keep the, you know, to, to keep Dennis on and, and Anthony and, uh, you know, you are going to have life after COVID-19. And, yes. and so we're all, I, I am going to send out something and we're going to fill up your freaking lounge uh, <laughs> with a bunch of Craig heads and drink champagne till the wee hours in the morning, or at least until so we're jumping on the vacuum and running it around our feet. Yeah, I'd love to have you guys in our private dining room as well. We've got a beautiful, uh, beautiful room back there. That might be fun. Ten of you. Don't be try fun. and don't try to condescend yeah. me with your private dining room and get me away from, <laughs> from the other guests. You know, then we can get loud and crazy. That's what I love about the private dining room. <laughs> when you have yeah. friends in the private dining room, then you don't have to worry about disturbing anybody. You know. Exactly. So that will be our next uh, our next broadcast. Dan, as Dennis and I were speaking on. Uh, Wednesday to do our practice session. We talked about doing a, a Zoom webinar on the dicks of the Napa Valley, and uh, but but that would be, certainly be one for the private dining room and not not for the public. But hopefully, I would not appear on that list. If you had a list to make out, Dennis, you would be like, I'd be like, wait a minute, I don't, what, I don't have a list. <laughs> <laughs> we know who we're talking about. Uh, well, I am so excited to get down and, and have some vino in your restaurant. We have, we have another Cabernet to go, but I am, I got to say, the Spring Mountain, uh, you know, in 2013, we didn't have enough of that to send out to our wine clubbers. And, and so we sent Merlot out from Hell Mountain instead. We've come up and down with this wine where we just have not had enough. And um, I am just so happy we have a little library of this uh, you know, 13, 14, 15, I buy, I've been trying to save more wine back because this wine achieves its perfume at about six years after vintage date. And it went from closed and kind of just an elegant, nice Cabernet to this really exotic wine. Mm. Christian, any thoughts? On this wine? I, I want one from the peanut gallery. Um. We had a question, what are the percentages of each varietal uh, in this Spring Mountain, this particular vintage? Excellent question. Um, it is always one of the highest percentage of Cabernet uh, wines that we produce because any time this vineyard has such a signature that, and uh, you know, I don't want too much Cabernet Franc in the wine as I just, as I discussed earlier. So usually it's around most of the Cabernet is around 80% that we make. And this wine is unusually, it's about 94% Cabernet, and then usually 4% Cabernet Franc, and then a couple percent of usually Malbec or Petit Verdot, just something to help the Cabernet unlock. But if you add anything to this wine from Howe Mountain or Mount Veter, it really muddies the, uh, the individual nature of the terroir of this wine. I feel like, uh, I want this wine to be this Spring Mountain. I mean, one of my favorite wines in the Napa Valley is, is Philip Tugney Cabernet Sauvignon. And it has such a signature. I mean, that wine is its own. Uh, that's the only place I've ever gone to taste where Philippe actually spit the wine out of his mouth back into the barrel. Oh my goodness. Oh, yeah, wow. I, was like, I was like, right on, man. There was, there was no bucket, there was no drain. Uh, just don't waste any gallons, less topping. But so it's old school, but such a beautiful wine. And and this wine, I don't want to mess it up because it's so it's such a signature. The so many wines age very very gracefully as well. Um, right now, I've got the 1991 on our wine list, and we've gone through a fair amount of it. And it's drinking beautifully. Well, when I started at Craig, you know, uh, Bob had decided he wanted a different wine style, one to introduce people to uh, mountain Cabernets that uh, were more easy drinking on release. And so that meant real, a huge amount of ripeness, a lot of oxidation, a lot of racking. And so starting in 2005, I kind of went the opposite direction. And so the wines that Robert Craig prior to 2005 are less age worthy, I feel like, and the wines post 2005 are going to be in the same category as like Togni wines. And that's just the nature of, of you know, uh, Bob slowly retiring and handing the business over to me. And, and uh, you know, I mean, to a certain extent, 
having Mountain Cabernet that's made to drink right on release is kind of like opening a decaf espresso bar in Portland, Oregon, you know? It's, uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's the wisest marketing tool for the business. All right, so let's move on to Diamond Mountain. I'm gonna show you all a beautiful picture of Diamond. So this is Peter Thompson's Diamond Mountain Vineyard. You can see Mount St. Helena there in the middle right of your screen. And when you look at the vineyard row on the, on the left-hand side going up, you can see how white that soil is. It's just this pure volcanic ash. And this is our old winemaker. Jason uh, pushed him off a cliff. Stephen wasn't looking. But, um, uh, Stephen is holding up a big old rock. You can see that big right, white rock from that vineyard. This, is, this vineyard is farmed by Pete Richmond. And here's the soil in the hand. It's this loose, pure volcanic ash in our section. Just incredible. But I, I really, you can see how different that is than the Spring Mountain Vineyard, that dark, uh, higher clay content, more water holding capacity in spring. So I'm going to take a pause for station identification and work out the Diamond Mountain here. The soil looks a lot like Volcanic Hill uh, at Diamond Creek. Exactly. Right. It's, it's kind of an anomaly. And, 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 uh, and, and, uh, I want to say anomaly for Spring Mountain. Mm -hmm. I'm like, it's anonymous. Oh, was that, was that soil at Diamond Mountain or, or Spring Mountain? That was Diamond Mountain there. Yeah, yeah. I just showed you. Remember the Spring Mountain Diamond soil? Creek. The Spring Mountain soil was bright red. I'll, I'll mm -hmm. flash that was back more red. very quickly. Yeah. So here's yeah. the Spring Mountain, mm -hmm. which uh, that's not volcanic tufa. It's more of a, it's more of a volcanic like clay soil. Mm -hmm. And then there is Diamond Mountain. Yes, that's the one that that looks like volcanic hill soil wise at, at Diamond Creek. It's the interesting crazy. thing I noticed that this is a northern facing vineyard, so typically a little cooler. Um, and I, I think the coolness comes through uh, in the glass here as well. Um, Red Rock Terrace at Diamond Creek is a northern facing vineyard. And so to me, those were some of the most mineral driven from Diamond Creek. Uh, mineral driven wines from Diamond, uh, Diamond Creek's lineup. And this has a very similar uh, profile where it's very mineral driven. There's a lot of, this, this is certainly less fruit forward than the Spring Mountain and, and has a, a really, really pronounced sort of uh, almost scorched earth character to it that I really love. I agree. It's, I mean, the, the other wines that come out of this vineyard are, you know, it was the primary source for La Coya back when they got their highest scores on their Diamond Mountain, you know, bottling uh, for the Jackson family. And uh, now it goes to Cardinal. And, you know, both of those wines now, uh, all the La Coya wines are now 500 bucks a bottle retail. And the Cardinal has gone to 375 So, I mean, this is a tremendous bargain. And, and uh, I think I personally feel like our Howe Mountain is our best Cabernet. Uh, bottling at Robert Craig, but we have to pay, you know, 15,500 bucks a ton to Peter Thompson for this. And uh, I just hate to, I hate to give up this fruit because it just makes this extraordinary wine. But the soil is, is very unusual for diamond. Most of diamond is more of a reddish color. This is just this pure white, like tufa, this volcanic ash. Kristen, did you have a question, a question for us? Yeah, so Lisa wants to know, what, uh, what was the first vintage of uh, Diamond? The first vintage of Diamond was 2012. Okay. And um, that wine is drinking really nicely. I think, you know, 12 is an overrated vintage in the Napa Valley. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, 15 is, as I mentioned last time, is an underrated vintage in the Napa Valley. So 12, I think we were just figuring out, we made really nice wine in 12, but to me, the, the best wines we made from that vineyard were beyond uh, 2012, because this, this the oak matchup, uh, you have to be very careful, like the, you know, we try and use a, a particular barrel for each wine uh, that we have. Sorry, I'm, I'm neglecting my wife again. <laughs> I'll give, your, give her the big pour. Country clubber. 
That means that, yeah, the country, that means that dinner's <laughs> going to be burned now. Uh, but um, it, it took us a while to figure out, like we used a different barrel, like the, you know, for the uh, Spring Mountain, it, you know, you cannot really use really aggressive barrels like Terenso and Hermitage on Spring because you just, you blow that beautiful elegance that the wine has. Whereas with, with Diamond Mountain, this wine needs a lot of wood and you hardly get wood. I mean, this wine is a tremendous amount of French oak, but you just do not get a lot of wood in the wine or I don't. I mean, it really seems, it really has this gorgeous sort of, like you said, scorched earth, that, that iodine and charcoal and, and again, some of that mountain flower that you get in the Maya Kamas range. This is a beautiful wine now, but in 20, 25 years, this thing is going to be amazing. This is the one you want to, you know, have on that big anniversary or your, your child's, you know, graduation, something down the road. Just salt this one away and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be amazing. It'll repay you for your patience. Come on, Dennis. It's, it's COVID. You want to you wanna have this if it's Thursday afternoon at 2 o'clock. <laughs> Like I mean, a true salesman on Thursday afternoon at two o'clock. Yeah, Thursday afternoon at two o'clock. Just put that baby in a big decanter and <laughs> and uh, you know put it on the back of the lawnmower for a few minutes and and roll it around the yard. It's it's ready to go. So uh, so Dennis, in choosing wine for your restaurant, I know you've always been a big supporter of Craig's from your time at French Laundry to uh, now at your at at, at Protege. So when you're choosing wine for your restaurants, you know, obviously you, you, you know, play in the deep end of the pool with some of the major league hitters. What do you look, what do you look for in terms of the California producers that you partner with? Mainly balance. I just think uh, that is, you know, I, I hate to overstate that, but to me, that's the, the biggest thing because in this climate, um, you know, the wines can get so intense. Um, sometimes they can be, over extracted, over oaked, the ripeness can can be too high. And so what I really look for is balance and elegance. Uh, as a sommelier, I think one of our primary, you know, concerns besides finding the right wine for the guest is finding a wine that is going to support the food and not overpower it. So I always like a wine that's gonna just come up right underneath the food opposed to on top. Um, I think it's really about support and, and creating a symbiotic relationship between food and wine where they can make each other better. And I think with the intensity and the concentration of California wines, for me, the key becomes balance. And people that are not trying to necessarily get the huge scores, they're really just trying to make wines that are delicious and are gonna age gracefully, gracefully and uh, be enjoyable with food, you know? Well, I appreciate that. I mean, this this wine to me was a '96 from Galoni, and I and I think you know what? If if we weren't named Robert Craig, it might be a '98 or '99 point wine. This in our Howe Mountain, you know, uh, somewhere else. If we had a you know, if we had a tasting room that was something out of Bill Harlan's pocketbook, but it's it's what we do. My mission is to have our wines be ageable, to speak of the site, and to be balanced enough to taste young. So. With Craig, we're not in pursuit of balance. We're just balanced. <laughs> oh, that's a, well, Dennis, what can I tell you, man? It has been, I, I mean, I have to say, rarely, Shelly, come on over here. Uh, rarely do, I, I have to tell all of the people that are here, just uh, if Dennis is one of the great hosts, I happened to be at French Laundry when Larry was still there and, you know, you were there. Michael's still one of the old guard that's that's still cranking it out on the floor, which is they're such Napa treasures, man. When when with you know, obviously the crew at at the laundry is amazing, but I can't wait to come down there when this stuff is over and just crank it out at the bar. You know, I know you're going to try and shutter me into the private dining room. <laughs> but, well, we'll uh, start at the bar. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll. We'll start at the bar. You can't keep me away from the public. When we start getting loud, is... that's when we'll retreat to the to the private dining room. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, your knowledge is amazing. I mean, just in speaking yesterday, your passion for wine. I just uh, it's so you are one of the great hosts that I've ever run across in the business. And so our 
you know, the years and years that we came to French Laundry, it was one of those things where, where the restaurant was more than just uh, a place to come and eat. It was an experience. And I think that when we all get down to Protégé in Palo Alto, I hope you all go down there and get a chance to, Venice, to visit Dennis and Anthony when, when this whole thing uh, opens up again. And thank you to all of our Craig Clubbers that have come on board tonight. Uh, gosh, I mean, Christian, I appreciate your moderating and to uh, Jamie and Kirsten and all the back of the house. Unlike those people that rhyme with Wes Jackson, we still have all of our employees at Robert Craig. There's been, there's been no 90% layoff uh, because our billions are so much more than their billions. But, of us. Uh, but you've all, all of you out there have enabled us to uh, stay in business and keep everybody on. I know that Casey is uh, watching today and he's been up working at the winery. He's 14 pounds down from his managing the tasting room <laughs> days. That's he's working his, working his ass off. Uh, so all the, to all of our Craigers that are on board, to all of the people out there, uh, these wines, so this, this will be edited and put up on YouTube. Uh, I'll finish the story of Mark the Claw. You know, eventually he was replaced by a fine farming man. And uh, he left for, he, he left in his camper van in the middle of the night, was never heard, heard from again. So now we have, you know, a great farmer farming it. That's part of it. Uh, but we'll tell all the stories. This will be up on YouTube and the wines will be available individually and as a three pack last time we sold out a little more quickly than i would have liked to but you all went crazy but from from shelly and me and our shelter in place here in sausalito uh your love and support is so much appreciated by our little gang on the mountain and dennis any last words for our guests no it's an honor and a pleasure it's great to reconnect with you and i can't wait to see the two of you in person yeah really nice to work with you as well Christian. <laughs> Ditto. You as well, man. Thank you. I love I you, man. All right, you guys. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank we're, you. Everybody stay healthy. Stay safe. We're we're Bye. ready to come to Protege, and we will not be we will not be sent straight to the <laughs> private dining room. <laughs> we're tired of cooking. No oh, I love you, man. Dennis, thanks so much. Bye, and Kristen, thanks. Thank you, Thank you. Bye, you guys. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. Finish your bottles. Yeah, exactly. <laughs>